The views expressed on Now You See TV are not necessarily shared by Now You See TV and its affiliates. As always we encourage you to seek truth and test all matters. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips. These special trips. But he said my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. All right, sorry about that. My microphone was muted. Welcome to Now You See TV. You're listening to The Midnight Ride right now with David Carrico. And tonight, as best, always, best. we have uh, David joining us as co-host in this whole thing. And so this is going to be an interesting show tonight because... Um, as you can see, uh, the title itself says it all, and I apologize. I'm trying to get this. I got some weird stuff going on my computer here. Um, for those of you that this is your first time listening, uh, please uh, be aware that we do stream on now you, or on YouTube, but we also stream on our web channel, uh, nowyoucetv.org. So feel free to check that out and to um, just come on and, and join us in our private chat. This is uh, – it's awesome because we have a moderated chat that you guys can actually go check out. And I'm going to screen share this, our, our website here real quick. So you can kind of check out what I'm talking about here. But if you go, if you're on YouTube watching live right now, uh, you can go in the description on the YouTube channel and it'll take you to our website here. Uh, this is the page for the show tonight and you'll have the, sh the, the video you can stream here. You also have a live chat, which you can make bigger. You just click this window and it, and it increases the size of the chat so you can chat. And then you can watch the video on another channel or you can go to um, the YouTube and watch it on there. So you can still increase that size on that, on that right there. So, but tonight's show, uh, as you can see, is called Project Montauk, the Philadelphia Experiment. And tonight we're having David Carrico and Scott Hensler and uh, the Montauk Project is an alleged series of secret United States government projects conducted at Camp Hero or Montauk Air Force Station on Montauk, Long Island for the purpose of developing psychological warfare techniques and exotic research, including time travel. Jack Vallee describes allegations of Montauk Project as an out, outgrowth of stories about the Philadelphia experiment. So that is basically what we're looking at tonight. We're going to be digging into deep, so stay tuned. Uh, one thing I want to make you guys aware of, this is something very important because uh, right now, uh, as we speak, a lot of the channels like ours are being snuffed out online and being sniped out and left. Timothy Alberino, uh, a guest that we've had on pretty regularly, his channel was taken down uh, the other day without warning. And uh, this could happen to us at any time, uh, which is we, we realized that this was a possibility. We've talked about this for a long time. Uh, which is one reason we started our subscription-based network, which is another reason we did our Roku too. And uh, we will continue to make arrangements just in case this doesn't happen or this does happen. So what I would urge you to do that if you enjoy this show and you enjoy the six nights a week we broadcast, five, six nights a week we broadcast, and you would like to continue watching in case something like this happens, I would urge you uh, to go to our website that I just showed you and go to the very bottom of the screen and sign up for our mailing list so that you can be in contact with us in case something like this happens. Also, I'd urge you to go to our social media sites and follow us on there. And if you haven't subscribed to our su subscription-based network, I would urge that as well. And Or if you have Roku and you like to add our channel, we also have – I did a video the other day that shows you how to do it. It's a private channel. It's not public. Uh, being a private channel gives you a little bit more freedom to do things that you would like to do you would like to uh, put out without having to worry about somebody coming and taking it down. So uh, we have those fail safes in place just in case this does happen to us. But I would, I would tell you that there's a very good chance because Timothy Alberino talks about some of the similar subjects that we talk about. So it's not like he's uh, doing anything much different than we're doing. So we, 
there's definitely a possibility of this happening. Um, in the in the in the doc, in in the intro that you saw there, you saw a um, you saw a trailer for a documentary that me and David put out not too long ago. Uh, we just released it on March first. It's called Dark Secrets, or Dark Covenant Secrets of Secrets, and it is a very interesting documentary about something that happened in Evansville, Indiana, and about something that happens all over the world. And I would definitely urge you guys to check it out and um, do that. You know, you can ch- check it out on our subscription based network, or you can get the DVD. So. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome David Carico and his show, The Midnight Ride. David, how's it going? It's going fantastic, John. And as always, it's an honor to be here on The Midnight Ride on Now You See TV with you and with all of our listeners. And uh, just really looking forward to the show tonight. Right. And uh, and I want to say that if you're in YouTube, I believe we have a moderator, Kevin. He just told me he was on there moderating. So thank you, Kevin, for being over there. Uh, our listeners are great, and we we do encourage people to be nice and and loving in the chats, whether they're on YouTube or whether they're on our um, personal um, chat. And either way, they are moderated, so we we appreciate that. And and so, anyways, yeah, um, thanks for coming on again, man. It's always a pleasure. I know next week we've got an interesting trip. We're going to meet up with William Schnoblin. Uh, to go to his house and interview him and talk to him about our upcoming documentary. Uh, We might stop by some uh, serpent mounds and and do some video in there. We've got a lot of stuff planned out just next week. Absolutely. It's going to be a busy week as always and so much going on, but we're seeing a lot of fruit from it and that's what matters. I'd rather burn out than rust out. Right on. So anyways, man, take us into the midnight ride and don't buck us off. All righty. Well, no promises on that, but I'm really excited about the topic tonight and I'm excited about our guest. He's new to Now You See TV. He's been on uh, FOJC radio and I have been on his network on the tinfoil hat club. And I really like what Scott does and you're going to like what he brings to the table tonight. We like cutting edge topics and cutting edge material and that's exactly what we're going to have tonight so scott welcome to the midnight ride thank you it uh is definitely going to be an interesting subject matter and i'm looking forward to passing that information on and at the top of the broadcast here tell everyone how to get a hold of you how to go subscribe to your youtube channel and find uh, how to listen in on the Tinfoil Hat Club. Get that out there here at the top of the broadcast, and we'll give that again also at the end. But let everybody know uh, where to find out and get a hold of your material. Okay. Well, I uh, have been doing deliverance for a very long time, as as some would refer to as an exorcist. Of course, the Christian church referred to it as deliverance. But in my uh, walk with this whole gamut of demonic versus the new world order and all every basically everything in between i've established a couple websites and the first one was scotthensler.org where i was basically trying to teach about deliverance and then as i mentioned is getting deep into that that uh, the demonic world is heavily uh, a part of a instrumentation or tools of the new world order so then i started tinfoil hack club Dot com. So right now, that's really where my show is. But now that I'm dealing with people who are TI or targeted individuals of gang stalking, I'm going to resurrect an old website that I had called We Proclaim. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, possibly starting next week with Julia Thompson, uh, we're going to be doing deliverances, praying for people uh, as much as possible, kind of like a group deliverance. But right now, most everything that I'm doing is on Tinfoil Hat Club. So if you go to tinfoilhatclub.com, you'll see all the links. If you go to scottenser.org, you'll see all the links. You'll be able to go to my YouTube channel from there, Scott Henser Network. And then I've got a couple of books, too, that are available for deliverance. Well, fantastic. And um, I'm sure that's going to be great. I really like Julia. Uh, She's... um, really going to be a voice in this area, I believe. So without further ado, take us into topic tonight, Project Montauk, the Philadelphia Experiment. Well, there's a lot of information about the Philadelphia Experiment, 
And what I was interested in was the link from Philadelphia Experiment to Montauk to CERN. And so that was where my investigation started, was to look for the means of mind control, to look for astral travel, interdimensional travel, portholes bringing creatures in from the dimensions. And when I started investigating, everything led basically from Tesla, Nicole Tesla. Now, he himself, I believe, was a good man. I think he was uh, an incredible individual, but he also was a spiritualist. And he did venture into the spirit realm to get his information. Now, I also believe that many of the other scientists had done the same thing. So the information that he had acquired to do a lot of the projects or to be inspired had to do with the fallen angels or the demonic. Now, anything that comes from that realm, obviously no good comes of it. A lot of the information that you can receive gives the presence of being good, that you can do something with it. It can heal people. You can do all kinds of things. But in reality, it's a snare. So unfortunately, I believe that Tesla had had basically got into that, but he also was a quite an individual with a high IQ. Uh, he was, uh, you know, quite an inventor. So a lot of what he had done, I believe in his heart, he was actually trying to bring technology to the world that would benefit man. But at the same time, I also believe that he was used as a intro or a a, uh, a way of bringing in technology that would change the world to a point of being able to control the masses. And so from his experiments from the turn of the century, basically also dealing on Long Island with his, uh, you know, attempt to, tr to transmit energy from one place to another, eventually led to the Philadelphia. So I, I want to point out that there's two basic technologies. Now we have what's referred to as scalar technology. And then we have what's referred to as transverse technology. Now, scalar is what Tesla had developed. Now, what that means is that a scalar wave, when it's actually going from point A to point B, travels at 2,000, 91,000, see, 291,000 miles a second versus 186,000 miles a second. So the basic engineering, the math, the sciences, everything that we've been taught has been based on 186,000 miles a second. When you get to 291,000 miles a second, all the geometries change. So there was a great cover-up that took scalar technology to put it and sequence it. Now what Tesla was trying to do is he was trying to give us free energy. But in his experiments, he found that he was able to warp time and space. He found that he was able to, to create a dome of protection. He found that he was able to move energy from one place to another. And so there was a lot of talk that the intent uh, that he was doing was in opposition to the bankers, J.P. Morgan, for instance. But I see it differently. What I see is that there was an attempt to take his technology, which also could be used for weapons, and I believe that that has, had been done even at that time. And that's really the reason for the dismantling of his project that he had in Long Island. And from that point, there, there was actually from 1906 to 1909, you could not own a radio. You could not own a spark app generator. You could not even have an antenna because there was such a mass confiscation of all radios because it was based on Tesla's patents, which, which then incorporated scalar technology. Now, Marconi himself even had his radios confiscated because even though he had changed some of the patents, his technology was still based on scalar. So from New York to Paris, you know, his first transatlantic communication was based on that. So when they took all of this away, they basically buried everything and steered everyone towards transverse. So transverse communication is what we know today. Public service radio, cell phones, microwave, everything that has to do with TV, radio, public service communications, military. 
So they basically kept the scalar technology away from us. Now, I myself, being in engineering, I work for Motorola, I work for General Electric, I've been with Intel, I've been with other companies. I myself wasn't even exposed to this. Now, I'm an extra class amateur radio operator. I've been a ham radio operator for well over 30 years. And even in that, I wasn't even aware of scalar. So it wasn't until I really started investigating what Tesla was all about and what they did to him. And everything, as I mentioned, was basically to take these two technologies, which I believe has to do with fallen angel technology, and only allowing us to have the conventional radio. Now, I'm just going to jump forward real quick. When this took place, there was so many different manufacturers, including those in other countries that were developing radios. And they too were basing it a lot on Tesla technology. So even ships that were coming in from other countries had their radios confiscated and or they had to dismantle them. So, they, so as soon as they left international waters and came within the United States, they had to dismantle them. So what they had done is they took General Electric, which was also in competition with Westinghouse, which was who Tesla was originally with, and they formed RCA Corporation. Now, Radio Corporation of America, whatever you want to call it, this whole thing was birthed from General Electric under the guise of the U.S. Navy. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to steer everybody towards transverse communication to make sure that the manufacturers out there were no longer going to be dealing with scalar technology. So this great cover-up, this great attempt, again, from about 1909 on all the way through 1919, when they finally uh, started releasing this, this uh, technology, then conventional use, public use, amateur use, commercial use, military use, was everything from that point was transverse. So again, the, the technology of Scalar was completely out of the eye of the public whatsoever. So RCA, again, was a great pioneer in this. Now, when they worked with Tesla a little bit more, when I say they, RCA, uh, the Navy, the military, Air Force, all of the different uh, groups that wanted any technology that could be used as weapons, they then brought Tesla back in in around 1938, or actually early in the early uh, 1930s, because they knew that with his technology that they, now you got to remember what year this was, right? And they're already working and, and looking at cloaking, taking images or, or mass devices such as a ship or a vehicle and trying to make it disappear. And again, this is because of scalar technology. So when they started this program, what they were doing, again, was trying to take anything that had to do with whether they they wanted to uh, make sure that anything that projected like radar or anything visual. So in 1930, the University of Chicago uh, then was brought in, Tesla came in, and again, invisibility was basic the basic project, again, pr uh, cloaking. So in 1933, the Institute of Advanced Studies of Princeton in New Jersey formed, and then from 1934, the project was moved to there. Now, at this time, they had great success. They were able to do what they wanted by 1938. They were able to make things disappear in the labs. And by this time, they developed over to Brooklyn Naval Yard. And in 1940, were successful in their first cloaking. Now, this whole project was without humans. Now, when they were ready for humans in 1941, this is where it gets sticky. Tesla himself, this is why I believe he was a good guy. Misled, but he was a good guy. That the, the information that he was getting even states himself that it was an interdimensional information that he was getting. So I just have to assume then that it's fallen angels. They were telling him that in the present state of the technology they had, that if they tried to incorporate humans, it was going to be disastrous. Well, you know, the military is one thing versus what's right is another. They wanted to proceed forth. And so by that time in 1941, Tesla had washed his hands. He didn't want anything to do with it. 
Now, at that point, the engineers that were with them said that they would do it. So they stepped up to it, and they proceeded again with uh, what we know as the Philadelphia experiment. And this did incorporate humans on board. Now, when they did this, this, by the way, was just off the Delaware River outside of Philadelphia. That's why they referred to it. You could see the New Jersey Bay across the other side. That when they did this, that it was absolutely disastrous. Now, when they started up this technology, which again is, is uh, the scaler, that it got out of control. They abs absolutely lost control of this ship. A blue light appeared. The ship, instead of going into a half state, because they were only going to go partial power, it went ahead and it disappeared. Now, they assumed that the ship was lost. It reappeared about three hours later. And when that took place, they found that there was damage to the hull of the ship. They found that there were men half in and out of the hull, sort of like uh, melted into it. There were still men actually floating in the air. There were, there were images of the men still going into the dimension and lost. Many of them that were on the ship were lost. They were disoriented. There were men who were insane. Uh, you can imagine the, the shock because they went into a dimension they just were not familiar with. Now, at that point, being in the public eye because of being in the Philadelphia area, they wanted to completely hush it up. So if you do the research, when they talk about the times and date, there'll be some some that will say it'll be in October, but what I found is this actually took place in August, and, and I want to tie that date in a little later for Montauk. So they shut the whole project down. This is one of the reasons they went to underground black op facilities, because they realized now that they were capable of doing something on a large scale, but again, they didn't have full control of it. So Tesla was right. They were not ready for it. Men lost their lives. In fact, men had to be cut out of, uh, one man had to have his arm amputated off. And of course, this was very disturbing to Tesla. So from this point, he really wasn't involved. He went on to other things, but he just washed his hands of it. Now, a few years later, though, they did talk him into coming back because they had realized that the men that were on this ship were so disoriented and that there was an actual change in their behavior, a change in their personality. So they wanted to investigate and look into this more. Now, of course, by this time, uh, the war was wrapping up, 1946, 1947. They recommissioned everything, and von Neumann was the one who was given the project. And von Neumann, by the way, was the one that took over the Philadelphia. And so the OSS was what was commissioned at that time, we eventually know it to be the CIA, and that they wanted to bring in what they called the Phoenix Project, and they needed a location for this. Now, Montauk being the Long Island in, in uh, New York, on the very tip where Hero uh, Camp Hero was at, that had been de decommissioned in the 60s. Now, there was what they called the Sage Radar. That was a radar installation that was in the UHF range around 440, 480 megahertz, but it was very high powered. So they wanted to take this facility that wasn't being used anymore, and then since it was on the tip, they could control who could come in and out. And so, again, that's then became the Phoenix Project under the Montauk. So the Phoenix Project originally was for cloaking. The Phoenix Project 2 then was for mind control. And that was, again, established at Montauk. And unfortunately, um, you know, the CIA, Monarch, MKUltra, all the horrible things that you've ever heard about were done on that location. And many of the men have come forth. We know a project that uh, they referred to as the Montauk Boys. They went for experiments picking up young boys all over the United States especially in, in uh, New York, because there was a lot of people, a lot of young boys uh, that had been runaways. A lot of them had been outcasts from their family, so they were just troublemakers. And so they actually had individuals go out and collect these young boys and bring them to Montauk. And from that point, it actually gets even darker. And just when you didn't think that it could, 
when you realized what they were capable of doing to young boys, now notice it was just men, young young boys, Not there were very few women at this point, um, that it is a circumstance that is beyond the comprehension of most individuals. Now, David, you yourself, you work with the occult, those who have been satanically richly abused. And so when it comes to MK Ultra, when it comes to mind control, it's all the same thing. It's basically trauma-based mind control. But what they found when they used the technology of radio waves, when they used their methods, that they were able to speed that up. So where somebody might take six months, they could do it in six weeks. And so from that point is really where they established the Phoenix Project, too, that we know as Montauk. If you have any questions, go ahead. Well, what we're seeing here with Montauk, this is really the genesis of all the MK Ultra Monarch, all of the sophisticated government trauma-based mind control. It all began right here, didn't it? Yes, it did. Now, by this time, there were several departments that were moving forth. And so there were other places. Now, Montauk, you know it on the surface, but there's also underground facilities. Now, Plum Island is just a little bit north from there. And, of course, we know that where uh, a lot of the experiments on animals, they look at it as a, a uh, facility for trying to control uh, uh, outbreaks from animals, trying to understand any sickness of animals. But in reality, this was another uh, black ops type facility for germ warfare, for the alteration of animals, hybrids, um, in fact, many of those creatures had washed up on shore. So that whole area, even uh, Plum Island to Montauk, I believe is connected. With the underground ability to bore through the earth, the United States is literally full of tunnels. We have, we've got underground bases everywhere. So potentially there's 25 bases worldwide. And by this time, since they started this in the late 60s and 70s. They finally finished out Montauk in 83. I'll get into why that happened. But literally millions of kids have been experimented on. Many of them are even uh, used today that, uh, like the Manchurian candidate. Many of them are spies. Many of them are the congressmen. Many of them are those who are heading up the CIA. Many of them are in the Pentagon, and they've come out of Montauk. So they were the success stories the way that they look at it. But there were children that were intentionally done, whether it was LSD, other drugs, fried by the radio waves from the, from the uh, radar that they recommissioned that had been remodified. So all these horrible experiments were done, not just on mind control, but to see what the human body could take and what the human mind can take. And it just, as I mentioned, it just the, the darkness of the people that were capable of doing this uh, is beyond the comprehension. But then when we take a step back, we find out that they weren't all human, that there were hybrids, there were those of fallen angels, there were those of what we refer to as reptilians that were working right alongside the guys at Montauk. And many of them had incredible stories about them. Now, when you are a creature that does not have a soul that comes from God, you're capable of doing anything to anybody. And so I believe that that's one of the reasons that they brought them in. One was that when you introduce what we refer to as trauma-based mind control, an individual that is one that comes and actually abuses the, the, uh, the victim, whether they're a child, whether they're an adult woman, they normally take turns. And the reason they do this, they'll have one come in and they'll introduce or they'll induce the trauma, whether they're striking them, cutting them, burning them, even, unfortunately, raping them, they only do it once because they have found that that individual who does this, that there will be some type of soul tie or relationship made if they come back and do it again. And that's not what they want because what they want to do later is they want to bring in a handler. They want someone to come in and be the hero. They want someone to be the one that they rely on. And so they repeatedly just have these abusers come and do this to the individuals. Now, not everybody can do this. When you take and split somebody up into multiple personalities, when you take and cause them to have alters, 
not everybody is capable of doing that. And so you do have people who break down. And unfortunately, a lot of the people who are in the asylums are the ones who cannot tolerate this, who actually have the breakdowns. Now, of course, any time that you do evil, the devil will be in the details. And so, as you know yourself, that when you have a multiple personality, there's usually a demon tied to it. And so, at the same time, this isn't just an experiment that has to do with the physical or metaphysical. This is also a spiritual. And so, they know full well that the individual that they're harming gets the demons. And the ones who were doing this, obviously, are demon-possessed. And so, this whole project that everything's been taking place has been one massive demonic um, infiltration of society. And of course, those that came from Montauk, those that came from these other projects, whether they were in California and they started satanic uh, groups, some of them unfortunately start churches. That was what their whole purpose are, was, that there's many churches out there run by pastors who came from Montauk. And those who finally woke up and tried to leave and get away from it, they have systematically eliminated them. Now, with the technology that they have today, the tracking, nanotechnology, far advanced from what it was 20 years ago, that they're able to uh, retrieve them. And so we have what we call my lab as well. And so a lot of the individuals that are abducted may actually think that it is aliens that abduct them. But in reality, it's just Montauk technology. It's just scalar technology that's capable of transporting from one place to another to take the individual out of the house, bring them to the facility, whether it's above ground or below ground, abuse them, experiment on them, and then replace them back and then monitor them. So with remote monitoring, we also know as psychotronics, everything though it sounds like science fiction, has been in place for a very, very long time. And you and I, unfortunately, are dealing with the aftermath. And so those that are listening to the broadcast that uh, believe that they have experienced this, you're not crazy. You have experienced this. Now, those that may be dealing with open doors with the, the demonic may experience something very much like this. And so... Uh, the demons can come and take you, and you can literally go into the astral plane. They do their dirty work. They bring you back. Now, unfortunately, when you come back, you then have maybe 10 or 20 more demons than you did before. And so the individuals that I work that have those types of open doors, that's a long project to bring them back. If you have somebody who's just a general sinner, just someone who did, who did a little party and did a little drinking, maybe a little fornication, you can work with them. But somebody that has been dealing with divination, somebody that's been dealing with witchcraft, um, the layers of the demons and the multiple personalities are much greater. And so it takes longer to bring them back. And again, uh, with Area 51, uh, with Dulce, New Mexico, with Montauk, all tied together, that a lot of that I have worked with, unfortunately, have been victims of that. And... Um, the, the layering that they put in, when it comes to a multiple, they'll actually layer in, through the trauma base, individuals that are protectors. So as I get closer towards bringing this person back out of this demonic realm, a multiple may pop up and intervene, stop the whole thing, run out the door, or cause such a, a commotion, and the whole multiple personality was programmed just to do that. And so it gets very complicated. It's kind of really a twisted mess. Um, and it, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, not everyone is brought out, and, and you know that, but there can be a point in time where a person can at least sustain their life. And, and so all this information that I'm bringing out is for everyone to understand that with the um, gang stalking that they're doing, which I, the individuals that do this, I refer to them as flying monkeys. The, the ones that are not completely human, that are act, actually hybrids or reptilians, I refer to them as laughing hyenas. That this whole, this whole experiment that you're doing on the population isn't just for experiment, 
the demonic realm actually enjoys tormenting. They actually, when, whenever you have the energy released from your torment, meaning that when you have fear, when you have anxieties, when, when you're literally thinking that you're going to lose your mind, this is like food to the demonic. They actually enjoy this. And so a lot of the gang stalking out there today is just that. But again, what I'm trying to do now with individuals who are gang stalked is to determine are they really gang stalked or did they just have an open door of the demonic? And I'm finding both. So it's one of the things that I do when anyone calls me. And that number is increasing. Now, gang stalking has been going on for a very long time, and I believe it actually uh, probably started from Montauk. So those who have been released into society, their intent was to torment, was to be uh, criminals of murderers, rapists, uh, even to, to be drug lords, even one to, to deal with prostitution. Because in this infection, in this environment where you're causing a society to, to behave in this manner is a complete open door. So the lot, of, lot of the victims that were unfortunately programmed that were successful in their view that were released was solely to take society and bring it down to a level that we literally have today. And that's one of the reasons I believe that homosexuality, that's one of the reasons I believe that transgender, that many of the people who started this, many of the ones who brought this out were for, were for Montauk or Dulce or Area 51. And uh, so again, this is where we're at. So, yeah, and um, the amount of missing children a year, the statistic is ridiculous. I yes. can't remember just what it is, but a ridiculous amount of millions of children go missing. And we've stated before, and I firmly believe that many of these children are winding up in these underground government facilities. Mm -hmm. And this is a government run program. And the entire, you, you can see how all the other government institutions from the court system to child, protect, check, child protective services, it's all an ugly machine that is geared toward the exploitation of children. And uh, it's, just a, uh, it's just a horrific and a disturbing, but yet a very needful thing for, for us to think about because it's a reality as you say, that is just uh, devastating so many people. And uh, we're just so glad that um, you are being able to rescue a few of them. And we can do that. We can't rescue them all, but we can certainly rescue a few of them. Right. And, and one of the things about uh, their, their method is to break the will. So a lot of them do not understand their worth. They don't understand that God loves them. They don't understand that they have a purpose. And that brings in hopelessness. So a lot of them have committed suicide, whether it's been suicide by police, whether it's been through drugs, alcohol, firearms, and or uh, that they themselves knew that if they wavered, otherwise left the program, that they would be eliminated. Now, a lot of them have the flashbacks. A lot of them have uh, a recount of the, you know, what they went through, and so their programming breaks down. And by the way, it's not for forever. Many of them have to come back and be rebroke again or, or sort of be refreshed. So if anyone's left any period of time, they'll eventually come out of it to a point. They may not understand everything, but now with the Internet, when they do their research or trying to figure out what's wrong with them, they find out real quick. So a lot of them do know. Now, of course, a lot of them have come forward. A lot of them are on YouTube. Now, unfortunately, a lot of them that were on YouTube are no longer with us. Some of them have already perished. Some of them have already died. They were Montauk boys. And some of the stories that they have about being retaken again, they'll be taken back to the facilities. And here, here's what is, is the reason that I tie the demonic. Anytime... And, and, I, and I'm very careful about how I say this. When, when you have ritual abuse, you also have the sexual abuse. This is part of the Montauk. This is part of the uh, method for breaking a person down. Children don't understand sexual abuse. 
they're led to believe then at that point that they're dirty, they're no good, nobody would love them because they've been violated. And, and so this loss of self-worth that takes place, again, can only come from the demonic. The demonic, because of, of the involvement with sex, you know, s such as sodomy, this takes everything to another level. This gives the demons more power because of this particular abomination that takes place. And so when you have sexual abuse, when you have these particular ceremonies, these um, rituals, it isn't just for breaking a child down. It's also for making a soul tie to the demonic. Because a lot of the people that I do work with, they're continually assaulted sexually by incubus and succubus spirits from this point forth. And so a lot of them don't in, engage into relationships or they try and have a relationship. Maybe they get married later. And because of the circumstances that take place, now you can have what's referred to as a spirit husband or a spirit wife too. And unfortunately that takes place. But in either case, my point is that whenever you have the, the um, uh, attempt to violate a child, that tells us how deep the demonic is. This is the bottom of the barrel. This is an abomination. This is the depths of Satan. And so when we look at these organiza organizations, whether it's the CIA, NSA, anything, any black ops out of the Pentagon, then obviously the individuals involved in this must be demonic. So many of them, whether they started into it or not, are eventually indoctrinated into Luciferianism. And so the occult is very heavily through our government, through the CIA. The Jesuits are in the CIA. And in either case, Jesuits, to become a Jesuit, they too are richly abused. They too are broken down. Anyone that is a Jesuit has gone through at least a 90-day uh, teardown of their, of their minds to be reprogrammed. And any time that takes place, then you have a handler. So every Jesuit that you know then reports to somebody. Anyone that you know that comes from these projects reports to somebody. And so there's a, and, and that somebody, by the way, whether uh, they're the men in black, whether they're uh, the, the preacher in a church, whether they're, you know, by the way, I hate to say it, but the Mormons, uh, unfortunately, are part of this too, that whenever you have this type of behavior, you have Luciferianism. It is all tied together. So I can assure you that those that were Montauk were in some type of cult, were in some type of involvement of worshiping Lucifer, worshiping the serpent. Now, I, going back to Montauk, there, there was the, the program for actually using psychics. Now, a psychic, uh, let, let, let's break a psychic down, okay? Now, you can have an individual who is very anointed. They'll have, they'll have words of knowledge. They have discernment. They have the ability to, to listen to the Word of God. Then you have those who do divination, those who actually use the spirit realm, whether it's the pineal gland, the third eye is opened up, divination, sorcery, witchcraft. And so they actually use the demonic, they actually use the demons like familiar spirits to get their information. So there's a separation of this. So what they were doing, when I say psychic, they're using individuals that have actually tapped into the spirit realm in the demonic side. So they had a thing they called the Montauk chair. So what they did is they were able to pass waves through an individual. There was a chair that had a, a, um, a what some would call it an egg beater type of antenna, but uh, it actually was a Tesla antenna because Tesla found that anything that was made in a pyramid had a dimension to it that was unlike any other antenna. And so the Montauk chair actually sat in this little pyramid-like antenna, and they were able to pass radio waves through the brain. And with the Cray computer and the IBM supercomputers, they're able to intelligently take the brain waves of alpha, beta, theta, gamma, reinterpret them, into some formulation of code that they could interpret to be visual, audio, or whatever was in the imagination of the mind. From that point, then they fed it into the radar, the SAGE radar that they had modified, 
and they were actually able to, at the high powered, split the spirit realm. So the psychic would sit in the chair, they could vir virtually, at Montauk, visualize or have a creation right there at Camp Hero, what was in the mind of the psychic. Now at that point, they were also able to record these. So everything that the psychic was able to do, and of course that not everybody could do it, only, only certain people had that ability, and they used them over and over again. But what they were also doing is that they were also using this to mind control the masses of the children that they had there. So they could take and regiment them. They could get all of them to do whatever this guy in the chair wanted them to do. And we see this with the X-Men. We see this with, I don't remember what the character's name was, that he had the ability to sit in this dome and go anywhere that he wanted to. That was, that was uh, brought in after the Montauk chair. This is what they were doing, was, was uh, basically telling us that they had this ability. And I just, I hate to almost say anything, Scott, you're unpacking it so well, but just uh, not that long ago, within the last couple of months, uh, Bill Schneblin, who was a Mormon, was talking about himself and other very, very credible witnesses that were talking about in the lower levels underneath the Salt Lake Temple, reptilians actually mm -hmm. being down there and interacting with the Mormon elders. Multiple testimonies of this, just like the Montauk boys would say that they were working side by side with reptilians. And yes. this really pushes the envelope with a lot of people. But it, yes. it's exactly the same scenario as multiple testimonies of what has gone on in Mormonism, if you say, and mm -hmm. also what the Montauk boys would say. And yes. What we're talking about here is actually, it seems to me, the electronic enhancement of psychic and demonic activity to where once a person has been split and broken and traumatized, that they can actually be electronically morphed into astral travel or uh, even telepathy or, or maybe even teleportation. Right. And, um, there's something... Last week, we did a uh, program on the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs uh, with Zen Garcia. And I want to read a passage here that reminds me of the Montauk chair. And what we're talking about, if I understand it correctly, in the Montauk chair, they could sit in this chair. And when they are enhanced with this scalar technology, they could actually, through visualization, bring creatures into our world. That's and, correct. And this is from the Testament of Reuben. And it talks about how the women were able to bring the fallen angels through the dimensional doors to cohabitate with them. And it's amazing. It sounds just like the Montauk chair. I'll read this and uh, you can comment on it. But in the Testament of Reuben, chapter 5, verse 6, it says, For they allured the watchers who were before the flood. For as these continually beheld them, they lusted after them, and they conceived the act in their mind. For they changed themselves into the shape of men and appeared to them when they were with their husbands. And the women, lusting in their minds after their forms, gave birth to giants. For the watchers appeared to them as reaching unto heaven. And when I read that, I said, yeah, we're talking about the Montauk chair. This seems like this is exactly what they were doing in the Montauk chair with a little electronic help. That's right. And in fact, uh, I believe that the uh, Tower of Babel may have been something very much like that. I think that this technology has been around a very, very long time. Uh, again, it sort of, it, you know, it was lost. Uh, you know, we, we went through another phase. I believe that the, the pre-Adamic, I believe that um, uh, the Garden of Eden was just one area that was, that was uh, a part of what was really going on. Because when we look at Cain, when he was cast out, he was, if you, and, and you need to read the King James, if you look at anything else, it really doesn't point out how he went into the earth. He was taken off the face of the earth. He was concerned that they, they would kill him. 
And of course, I've heard just about everything to explain they, but I believe that this pre-Adamic race, which has to do with reptilian, which has to do with, with those, have uh, things have come and, go come and gone. But in either case, when we look at... Um, when we look at the Montauk chair and you talk about being able to um, to astral project or to be able to have things come to you, they were also able to take one of the, so otherwise you had the operator, when they would focus the SAGE radar onto an individual that they had in another building in another room, they could take that person and they could send them into the astral plane. And so there was a lot of children. There was thousands of children that came through Montauk that are missing, that are gone. And through their experiments, because they didn't have it right, right off the bat, that once they sent them in, they never did come back. Or if there was a power glitch, they had to run off of generators, that in that power glitch, that the child that they sent into the spirit realm were into the dimensions of the third and fourth. And by the way, they... They're claiming, too, that they were in the 22nd dimension or even higher. I, I, I don't think that there's any really limit to the dimension because that's God's world. But in either case, the children that they were using, that's exactly what they were doing. Now, you can look at some of the old photographs, like in the Civil War. You can see people that look like they were using cell phones. You can see where they were, you know, maybe messing with an iPad or something of this nature. So a lot of the old photographs will catch people who went back in time. And again, I think that, uh, that uh, CERN was really the, the uh, end point of the whole means. And from the Montauk chair to CERN, they're literally doing the same thing. Now, um, all over the world, that very much like, the, like what you were talking about, the Mormon temple, and by the way, the Vatican, too, the reptilians are oh, yeah. down underneath there. Um, I've dealt with those who have been in the inner courts at the Mormon temple, like in Salt Lake. And again, it, when, when you have a, a female instead of a Montauk boy, when you have a female, they refer to them as beta or beta kittens. And so anyone that enters into the center courts of the Mormon temple is either a 32nd degree and higher and or if it's a female, then they're a beta kitten. So they've already been they've already been abused. They've already been programmed. And this is uh, again information that they don't like to let out. But I have interviewed those who have been into the inner courts. I've interviewed those that have seen the chambers, that have seen those that are held in captivity, very much like um, uh, Dulce. That all of them again are considered expendable. But when, whenever you have a reptilian, whenever you have a creature that is a hybrid, you also have those that are flesh eaters. You also have those who, who, uh, who need the blood. And so, unfortunately, many of them are used as sacrifices. Yeah, and I am totally down with you on the pre-Adamite concept. And I think that's exactly what they are doing. They are recovering the antediluvian, even pre-Adamite fallen angel technology, and they're doing their best to take it to another level. And I think this is exactly what CERN is all about. Could not agree with you more. And yeah. uh, it's, um, it's just amazing. And the fact that they put this on the X-Men, you know, that is just the, uh, ultimate insult. This is what they like to do. They like to yes. talk this. And uh, so much of this we see uh, throughout movies like that. But yeah, it's just an amazing scenario. And we have to, if what we had take place, and I, and I believe it was, I believe that we had a genuine time travel event there with the uh, Philadelphia experiment mm -hmm. and that has to open up the possibility of time travel. And I think that this is something that they are very, very seriously looking at at CERN and maybe even have achieved to some degree. And I very much believe, and I know as you would in the sovereignty of God, we couldn't have some kind of ridiculous scenario where Satan could go back and stop the crucifixion 
or Satan could go back and change God's word. It endures forever. But mm -hmm. there are, uh, what do you think is possible? I mean, in the realm of, what do you think is capable in the realm of time travel and actually changing something? And I just want to say something real quick. I am a skeptic on the idea of time travel, so you guys got to convince me here. <laughs> you got to convince me. Well, again, scalar technology is the basis of this. Um, when you're able to take a atom, a proton, an electron, and arrange them in the order that uh, is beneficial to what you're doing, then you're able to control it. I mean, Jesus walked through walls. We have encounters where spiritual things come and walk through walls. And so it's a alteration of, a, of, uh, of, of the realm itself being whether it's the fourth or fifth dimension. Satan fell into the second heaven. That was my book, Second Heaven Invasion, the spirit realm, the third and fourth dimension, wormholes. I mean, this is what Einstein was all about. But actually, I believe Einstein was brought in to alter and change what, uh, what uh, Tesla had already figured out because they wanted to cover up the scalar. They didn't want us to know about this technology. Um, by the way, David, uh, ziggurats, I was trying to think of the name. Uh, ziggurats, I believe, are part of, uh, that are all over the world, that they may have been a duplication of the Montauk chair. But in either case, when, when it, you're able to, to induce a voltage and a current into a group of electrons, now, nanotechnology is very much like that. The nucleus that's around, let's say, lead or tin or copper, they're able to control uh, the atoms that rotate normally around. And by forcing it into a different physics, then it becomes a different element. And this is part of what nanotechnology is all about. So you can take and split atoms, the atom bomb, in fact, when they were detonating nuclear bombs, they were finding out that things were actually coming and going in the spirit realm because it was a infraction of the, of, uh, of the dimensions. So in either case, CERN is a controlled nuclear device. But it isn't just that because of the magnetic loop that it has. One of the things that had to do with cloaking with the Philadelphia experiment is what they call degaussing coils. And CERN is very much like a degausser coil. And so by arranging the magnetic fields in such a high intensity, then you're able to alter its dimension. You're able to warp it. You're able to make a wormhole. Now, that takes a lot of power. And what that was one of the reasons that the psychics were used at Montauk because of their ability to focus that power, instead of it being an omnidirectional, it would be focused into one area. But in either case, what we have is we have this technology in the hands of people who are crazy, that are, that are madmen. And that is a, a circumstance that, uh, that should frighten us all. But the other thing that, that you asked about, can they go back and alter time? Well, the Mandela effect right now is being reported all over even scripture, even uh, movies, even reports or, or documentation or songs. People remember the words of songs when they were, you know, back in the 70s when they were teenagers, and now they hear the song again, and it's completely changed. It's not the same words. So what are they doing? Well, if you take somebody and you send them back, all they need to do is influence something, and it'll alter and change. And so what we have today is we have what we call the Mandela effect. And there's certainly a lot of evidence to, to point in that direction. If you go on YouTube and just simply type that in, you could spend hours of all the um, uh, examples of the Mandela effect. So when it comes to understanding the, the physics of our world, you know, well, for instance, let me, let me point it this way. Okay, so I'm sitting here at a table that is solid, but in reality it is not solid because of the atoms that make up this material and that the spaces that are between the two atoms, though it is minute to our eyes that we cannot see it, we need an electron microscope to see it, 
then in reality, there's spaces between this table. Now, the question is, what holds it together? Why does it not flow apart? Why does it not fly apart? Well, obviously, God's hand is upon this, and he's keeping everything contained. But by using magnetism, by using intense energy, focused energy, we can part these atoms. And by doing so, then you can take something and bring it into the next dimension. When you go into the next dimension, then that is where time can be altered. And when you control time, then you can either go forward or you can go backward. So if God, in, in all of his magnificence and all of his power, then obviously with the, um, um, like the book of Revelation, knowing ahead of time of the events, then this is part of time travel. This is part of understanding what was, what will be. Nothing new under the sun. And I think that everything that has been put into place in the hands of those who are madmen, because the, anyone that's in Luciferianism, anyone that partakes in this is either demon-possessed, demonized, who is already a psychopath. And by the way, one out of 100 individuals in the United States are uh, fit the criteria of being a psychopath. They tend to gravitate towards uh, power. They're the ones running basically the government. They're the ones running uh, local governments, state, county. And whenever you have somebody that is a psychopath or even a sociopath, you have somebody that also in the category of personality disorders is also a narcissist. That means that they have no love of their fellow man. It means they're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve what they desire. And so this technology got away from Tesla, got in the hands of the United States government, got in the hands of the Soviet Union. They've been using scalar technology for astral projection, astral travel. Now, I wanted to, to point out that when I became a Christian, I was actually trying to experiment a little bit about New Age. I was trying to, to do... Um, uh, transcendental meditation. I was trying to do something like that. Well, lo and behold, I did. And unfortunately, it did not end well. And I was in an environment that I refer to as being cast out into outer darkness. What I think God was doing was, I, it was you know, okay, you want to mess with this? Let me show you what's really going on here. So at 11 o'clock at night in my bedroom in Mesa, Arizona, I had this experience that literally was hell in itself. Demons, you name it. But the, the incredible thing was, is the demons were bad enough, but it was the loss or the lack of love. There was no more God's love. There was no more understanding of the peace that the Holy Spirit brings. Now, even though I wasn't a Christian, I didn't realize around me was the love of God. So when I was put into outer darkness, that love was removed. That was so terrifying to me that I said, God, make these things go away. Now, why did I say that? I don't know. But God honored that. When I came back, it happened at 11 o'clock. It seemed like it might have been two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. When I came back into the physical, I looked at the clock, and it was somewhere between one and two in the morning. So what seemed to be only a couple of minutes was a couple of hours. So when you go into time and space, when you go into another dimension, then there is a, a, um, an acceleration or, or a deceleration of time. And when you can master that, now you need to remember that they're using artificial intelligence, okay, which is quantum computing, along with the Cray computers, along with uh, the IBM supercomputers, and by harnessing energy, by harnessing the psychic ability, by manipulating, manipulating it into whatever they want to do, they've been able to do this. Now, of course, um, I, again, we're told not to do this. This is divination. This is sorcery. This is witchcraft. Now, anybody that comes to me that has been in this uh, particular cult, uh, whether they were uh, clairvoyant, whether they were doing necromancy, whether they went to, you know, to uh, psychics. What I do is I close their third eye. 
Now, when I pray for that, I also pray for those who come out of Freemasonry or who have the Freemasons curse to close the three, third eye. We're talking about Horus. We're not talking about breaking away or stopping anything that may give us wisdom and discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit. So think of it as not just closing an Arcadia window. I'm closing the screen. I'm making sure that whatever comes in and out, like an IP address on the Internet, I'm filtering I'm putting up a firewall. I'm making sure that the influences that come in do not come in from the demonic. What they're actually doing with the Montauk chair in CERN is they've opened up that door even wider, and they're using this technology and this energy to do this. So they're literally going in, and I can assure you, when they go into the spirit realm, when they go into the other dimensions, that since this is an abomination, that they've opened up a door that uh, just just as the pit opens up in, in the book of Revelation, maybe those that are in chains underneath the Euphrates River, those that we see in the book of Enoch that were uh, put away for coming into the daughters of men. In either case, what we have coming into the spirit realm, that that um, that this, this was never an intent. We've got things in our spirit realm that were never intended to be here. And this is a situation that, as, as the word says, men's hearts will fail them for fear for those things coming upon the earth. So whether you believe in time travel or not, you need to understand that they do. They not only do it, they use it. Not only do those who are in the occult astral project, they go into the astral plane. But anybody that does that, there's a piggyback. When they go in and they come back, they bring something with them. And when they bring something with them, it is, uh, it's another level of demonic. It's another level of something. Now, the, the situation that the angelics, the angels, the one-third that fell, who's to say that many of them were marooned on another planet? Now, we do have planets. We do have stars. Who's to say that they're not there and they can't get here because their wings were clipped? Whatever the issue is. I believe that this technology was to help bring them back. And I think that's also shared with Tom Horn. I don't agree with everything that Tom says, but I, th I think he is onto something. Because when we look at the Vatican, when we look at the Lucifer telescope on Mount Graham, they're observing, they're watching things that are out there. Now, the Van Allen belt, whether they can't come in and go because of it, that if they're able to manipulate and control the energy that seems to be this dome that's over us, that if they're able to come through this, then they're able to bring in mass numbers. Because when we see in the book of Revelation, when it comes to you know the world coming against Jesus, when, it, when, they, when this takes place, who in their right mind would do such a thing? When it comes to Armageddon, right? Who's that stupid? Well, I think that these things that are coming in, I think that's part of what tries to come against Christ himself. Yeah. And that is a fascinating concept. And I don't know if time travel is possible. I don't know. But uh, certainly, even when we are in prayer and worship, we conceive of time differently. When mm -hmm. we enter into the presence of God, we can uh, be there for a very long period of time that seems to us just a very brief time and people with um multiple personalities they can be driving uh let's say from denver to st louis and they can be driving for four hours or however long and then all of a sudden they're at their destination well they were in another state of consciousness to where they were not aware of time. They perceived of time differently. So uh, I think most of wh when I looked at the people that were uh, the Mandela effect, most of them, I rightly or wrongly just put in the nutwhacker category. I uh, Maybe I just looked at the wrong ones. But when we look at what we're talking about tonight, this technology, if what these guys said did happen, we have to at least consider the possibility that right. it's a possibility. And certainly, I believe, whether it's possible or not, 
that the people at CERN, that they believe it's possible and that they are trying to do it. So it, it's, uh, it, it's hard to understand, certainly I don't all what is going on, but in many of the cases of reincarnation, where familiar spirits have looked back in time, supposedly, and related uh, historical information, whether they're not necessarily going back in time or seeing back in time or what's going on, there is something here that is a piece of the puzzle in this dark operation of what Satan is instigating. And it's something that I think is very good to put on the table here to try to understand, because it seems like the more you take these concepts and you're able to kick them around, somewhere down the line we can get some understanding and clarity. But it's uh, it's an amazing thing to, to contemplate. Well, you know, it, it, when I do a deliverance and someone comes in, and I have to have an open mind. I have to listen to them. Whether the, whether they're uh, hallucinating, whether this really didn't happen or not, it's still a clue to the circumstance. Right. And so to throw any of this out, um, again, would then be denying the technology that is that is available. Right. And we have to, rem we have to remember that uh, they don't want us to know anything. And, and, and when we see this in the movies and when we see it in articles and when we see it in different things, they're laughing at us. This is part of the occult. We know that uh, the, the New World Order, the Illuminati, through Hollywood, through all the representation, whether you know it's uh, uh, a, a pyramid in the back representing something or the hand sign that they do or even the circumstance, you know, like X-Men, they're telling us what they're doing. And when we do not stand up against it, when we do not expose it, then we're literally giving them carte blanche to continue forth. We're giving them the red carpet to do it. Right. And something, too, we want to uh, emphasize is that such things like traveling to the astral plane, this is not something that God's people are supposed to do. And there are actually people that are ministering to SRA survivors by going into the astral plane themselves. And when you hear this, get away from it. Just run from it as uh, fast as you can, because that is a person that is in the occult themselves. Right. And this is just something that you just want to run from as fast as you can. Well, the, the other issue with that is... is um if you have somebody that is infected, when I say infected, they've got demons. And a, a colleague of mine laid it out. You know, you can have the flu, you can have the virus, but you're not the flu. You're not the virus, but you have it. Demonization is the same thing. Now, I separate demonization versus possession. Possession's at a point where you've literally sold your soul, that they've taken you over and you no longer, well, your, your conscience has been seared. When you're demonized, then you have demons that are influencing. You have them in your head, you have them in your body, you have them on the outside. When, when you have that circumstance, and if you go to somebody who's ministering in that form that you're talking about, all they're doing is adding fuel to the fire. Yeah. Because then you're not discerning, you're not able to make a decision based on the truth, based on God's word, based on the things that, uh, that, that bring bring truth. Without truth, you have a lie. And when you're in a lie, you have the demonic. God is a God of order, and that's out of order. So therefore, it isn't of God. So I could never go along with it. And chances are, it was the astral travel that got him in the trouble in the first place. Yeah. Uh, many, many of the um, victims didn't astral project until they were sexually assaulted, until they were sodomized. There's something to do with that particular circumstance, which I believe has to do with the base of the spine. That, you know, we, they refer to chakras. I, I always try and stay away from the New Age lingo, but, you know, there's a lot of it that is based in, in truth. It's just how it's implemented. That whenever you have this take place, like the Kundalini, yoga, the higher enlightenment, what you have then is you have a possession of the spine, you have the mind that's taken over, and it's really demons placed into the individual. When I do a deliverance, I can, 
unwrap them off the spine. The person usually regurgitates, the spirit comes out, or they quiver and shake or whatever. But once that takes place, then their mind is free. The witchcraft, the blocking, the hindering spirits that have them in bondage for them to think a certain way, that once that's released, then they can start hearing from God instead of hearing the noise that comes from the demons. So anybody that practices that, I absolutely agree, stay away from them. There's a lot of psychology out there, too, that's being implemented in with um, some of the so-called deliverances. A lot of the deliverances that I've seen or, or people that have come to me went for deliverance, and they got even worse. They got more demons yeah. because of the methods had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It had to do with New Age. So you have to be very careful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, what you say is right, and it's difficult even to talk about. It's so perverse. But there, there was actually a split between the British and American OTO because of the rights involving sodomy, the sex magic. The British uh, were offended by that. And there was actually a split because of that very fact. And what we would call uh, the OTO practicing sexual ritualistic magic, the left-hand path or the entering into the dark side of the Seraphoth is through that avenue. And it is a terribly perverse thing. And uh, it's something that uh, the Lord can deliver you from. And people that are involved in this type of thing. And it's far, you know, we, we talk about this thing and well, it's just, well, maybe one person here, one person there, but the sad reality of it, there are thousands and tens of thousands of people that have been subjected to this type of thing. And I believe that of the thousands and even millions of children that go missing every year that many of them are winding up in these underground facilities and are subjected to this type of thing. So I am certain that there are people listening to broadcast tonight uh, that have been subjected to this type of thing. Uh, it, it's just inevitable. And there is help. There is deliverance. And uh, you certainly are welcome. We, we want you to reach out to Scott's ministry or ours. And uh, we want to help you to find solutions uh, in Christ because there is help, there is deliverance, and that's why we're doing what we're doing because there is freedom and deliverance in Christ. And um, it is uh, one of the reasons why they're able to propagate this horror in such a mass extent is because it's so doggone difficult even to talk about it in the most benign manner in in a public forum because it's so evil and perverse truly inventors of evil things is a applicable term to these perverse evil people it's just beyond imagination of what these people do but yet it's reality i've seen it firsthand and uh you know what can we say? That's why we're doing what we're doing, to see people delivered from this horrific evil. Yes. And, and um, again, you know, you talk about children, the human trafficking or the child trafficking, like Pizzagate and all this other, it's all tied together. There's a common thread that runs through all of it. And whether, you know, it's the United States or whether it's in Britain, whether it's in Africa, um, again, these are all the same people. Now, the, the network of those traffickers, that when they do take children and they bring them to Dulce or they bring them to 51, Area 51 or some of the others, they're not necessarily there for ritual. They're also there for food. There are villages literally within Mexico that have been depleted of their children. There have been trucks that have been stopped at the border by uh, the, the agents who were not aware of this program opened them up and saw that there were stacks of frozen children already and that uh, the agent that was on the on the uh, particular case or the one that stopped them and found them was removed the vehicle was allowed to continue on um, this this uh, I, again 
we're we're going to see more of it. In, in fact, the, the the perversion that you're talking about is actually part of bringing homosexuality out. A lot of the ones that I've worked with in deliverance, along with it, is cannibalism. They felt the need or the desire to consume their lover while engaging in this act. And, of course, that's what we see in the rituals. Um, one of the photographs that I saw of a young girl, there was a, a, um, a rescue that took place during the ceremony. And when the SWAT team came in or whoever the men that came in to uh, rescue this girl, they were about halfway through. And the picture that I saw was the little girl in the emergency room and half of her leg was gone and half of her arm was gone. And it was during the ritual. So they literally, while they were sodomizing her and doing this, they were also eating her. And of course, the bloodletting and everything else. So ladies and gentlemen, this really does take place. The people that are doing this are also the ones who have this technology. And I, I tell you, a, a, as I look into it deeper and deeper, just when I think that it couldn't get deeper, it does. And that's certainly something that we could confirm through our experience here in the Blue House case here in Evansville. Uh, there were middle school children that reported that they were involved in rites of cannibalism right here in Evansville. They said that they were being taken out of the public school and taken to a blue house. And one of the things that multiple children said is that not only was there sacrifice, animal and human, but that there was also cannibalism of those sacrifices. So this is a common thread. This is a common thread of this uh, disgusting phenomena that's reported on a worldwide basis, and there's reasons for it. And John, Sister Donna, just flashed me a sign that we've got lots and lots and lots of questions. So okay, I think perhaps, uh, are you there, John? I am here, David. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, we do have lots of questions. and um... So maybe even tonight, there. I'm sure there are so many. Uh, let's just go ahead, and uh, we're about 10 minutes uh, earlier than we usually break, but I, I kind of got the feeling tonight that we still ain't going to have enough time to get them all in. So let's, uh, let's just go ahead and start shooting some questions of Scott from the listeners. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so Devin asked, uh, is there a place to put in my email to get updates from Now TV? I'll answer that real quick. Yes, uh, you just go into the bottom of the page that I talked about earlier, and there it says sign up for updates. Next question is from CB. Uh, we've developed as a means to contact the spirit world. Where radio is the same but just for communication. Uh, well, if I understand it, uh, trying to equate radio communication as clairvoyance, um, no, it it's completely different. The radio waves are done through electromagnetics, through a, a uh, passing of current that influences electrons to move in a certain pattern. When you're doing clairvoyance, you're using a separate energy, which may actually be something like scalar, but it is a energy that comes from the dimensions or comes from familiar spirits, comes from uh, like a telekinesis, something that we really don't understand in our state or in our being as Christians or ones who do not practice such things. But those who are in the occult, those who are in uh, new age or those who ask or project or do any of this, they've tapped into it. So the human mind, the will of the individual, there's something here that um, goes to another level. So radio waves are not the same thing, but but let me let me point this out, that there is a device that was originally coined the Frank Box. Now demons, spirits, actually learn how to manipulate the Frank, or to manipulate radios. Um, see, what was it? Uh, the Lizzie Borden house, for instance. One of the first original cordless phones, you know, remember the, the ones you had to pull the antenna out? 
when they had one installed in the Lizzie Borden house, which became a bed and breakfast, within weeks, the demons learned how to manipulate the cordless phone, and the people who were the residents of the house could not even use the phone because the demons were on it so much. And when this became public, a man by the name of Frank, I don't remember his last name, who was a radio engineer and a ham radio operator, looked into it and came up with a wide spectrum receiver. And now you could set this little box in a room and you could ask a demon a question or ask a spirit a question. It would actually answer back through the radio. So they've learned how to manipulate it. So it's two separate things. Now, of course, that's still divination. That's still necromancy. That's still clairvoyance. And I've been warning everyone ever since I found out about it over 10 years ago, do not partake in such a thing because it's still just that. And it was punishable by death in the Old Testament. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question. Um, have you, how have you collected all this information from this is from Donna? Well, over 17 years of deliverance and dealing with those people who come out of the occult, those who have been in the military, um, by the way, a lot of the troops who are coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq see this. There are demons that are manifesting on the, on the, uh, uh, basic, the, the war areas those during combat, those that have gone into the tunnels that have been having to clear out where there have been uh, Nephilim or, or hybrids within them, those who have been in engineering, those who have been in different uh, black ops, they needed deliverance, they needed help, they needed to come back into society. So when I started working originally with some of the people who didn't tell me at first that that's what was going on, when there would be a manifestation or an altar that would come forth, then that information would come up. Now, of course, I, I don't take anything as a grain of salt, as a grain of salt from, from that particular thing. But when I start researching, that's what led me into psychotronics. That's what led me into voice to skull technology. That's what led me into understanding that there's a whole other science out there that is uh, part of this demonic world. So it's just been a little bit over time. Again, it's it, it's also the fact that it keeps uh, the the numbers keep coming up, the probability, the same thing over and over and over again. Then I have to take a look at it, and of course with the with the internet, there's just so much garbage out there. There's just so much lie. In fact, I've been warning too that uh, that those who um, have been trying to express about uh, the different technologies or or the uh, circumstances that have to do with gang stalking. There's a lot of misinformation out there that's intentional. So I would say that the the edge that I have is because of the deliverances. I've had the opportunity too, by the way, that once that person's healed, once that demon's cast out, see them completely change. See them now uh, have a love for God that they never had before, or even a love of themselves because many of them are so broken and wounded. So it, it's it, the, the question um, is not an easy one to answer because it's been over such a long period of time, but it's the verifying over and over and over again that when I look up a piece of information, does the right answer keep coming up again and again and again? So I think that's how I can stand with that. And I just might say something that I like about Scott's ministry in the way he ministers deliverance is that it must be based on sincere repentance. Yes. And today we have a church in America that preaches salvation without repentance. And we also have deliverance ministers that will give you deliverance without repentance. But there is no such thing as true deliverance without repentance, and it will just lead the deeper and deeper bondage. And in the area of deliverance and SRA, so much of what we learn is experiential. You learn by doing. I know that uh, back when we began dealing with it in the late 80s, uh, we just were thrown into it, so to speak. And we just did the best we could. And what you, uh, you confirm what you can with the word of God and you confirm what you can with research 
the spirit of God helps you and away you go. And uh, it is doable. Certainly, I am the most uh, ordinary of all people. But when you just have a heart for God to help people, he will help you. Right. And it's deliverance is not for everybody, even though we've been called to it. Um, you're, you're right. If, if there's a particular issue with a person, and let's say the demon manifests, it has a legal right to be there because there's a particular issue the person has not repented of. And I'll usually send the demon down, tell the person what's going on. They'll recall the circumstance of that particular sin. And then when they repent of it, then that demon comes flying right out. It's that simple. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. And that's deliverance 101. You yeah. found, you find the ground, you find the doors, you repent of the ground, you cast it out. Now that's of course, uh, a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's basically it. That's what you do. And right. if anyone's doing anything else, they're going to get you in more problems than they're going to get you out of. Right. All right, guys. Next question from Cot. Um, is Scott aware of David Pauline's research on the missing 411 project? And if so, are these missing people being abducted for secret projects such as Montauk? Yeah, a lot of them are being taken out of uh, parks, you know, like federal parks and states and everything. Um, absolutely. Uh, again, my labs is part of this uh, particular project. Now, I'm not totally familiar with what he's doing, but I am aware of that situation, and that's what I equate it to. And you need to remember that it isn't just one agency, whether that's the Navy, whether that's uh, the, the, the Marines or just the Army or another black ops out of the Pentagon or the CIA or the NSA or even the Soviets, Spesnots, or the Chinese. Um, they're all doing it at the same time. So exactly who's doing it, I guess, is the question. Not really that it's happening, but who is doing it? And it turns out they're all doing it. All right. Uh, Donna has another question. Do you think the reptilians are Nephilim, or could they just be people dressed up like reptilians? Well, let's break down what a reptilian is. There are those that have been bred to look more like humans. They still have their DNA as a reptilian. But in order to stay cloaked, they're either having to take in the blood of humans, because the nutrients that come in, that's one of the things the vampire thing's all about. But at the same time, they also have the ability that through um, their, let's just call it the, the pineal gland, that they're able to, to cause such an influence that when you look at them, you don't see them as the creature that they really are. But as a Nephilim, a reptilian, I think that, uh, that they're definitely connected because when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore giants, then those giants then, as we read in the book of Enoch, then went into other things. So we have insectoids, we've got amphibians, we have the reptilians, that falls under the thing of Dracos, so there's a very large classification. If we try and group them all together, then that really doesn't work. What we have to understand that they have, over time, been breeding into society. That's part of what the abduction is, from taking, from taking eggs and sperm, combining them together in the labs. And by the way, there's been many rejects. There's been many that have been, whether they were born in a test tube or whether they were carried in term into females or even another creature, uh, there's been so many that have been destroyed, so many failures, thousands, millions over the years. So I think what we have is a, a great number of different creatures. Uh, when, whenever you have a true uh, Nephilim, you're going to have something of size. You're going to have something that's very tall, very powerful. So when we're talking about a reptilian, then we're talking about one that took a Nephilim, just like you maybe took a wolf and you bred it to be a chihuahua. This was something that, that, took, that uh, took time and, and, of course, is uh, part of the labs that they've been doing. And, of course, again, that's part of the Super Soldier Project. Now, one thing I just might say, one idea that, and thought that I have had about it, and, and, you know, when you talk about 
the dark realm and fallen powers. Um, I call them celestial beings because we have seraphim, we have cherubim and fallen angels. And it's not quite as simplistic as we like to think. But I believe that the reptilians could be the seed of the seraphim. I believe that Satan and the Assyrian were seraphim, that they were reptilian. Uh, we know from the book of Job that uh, Leviathan is certainly reptilian. But, you know, that's just a, something that, that I believe we could be talking about the seed of the seraphim. Right. And, and why we have other things in the Nephilim world look different is because we have different fallen angels producing different, you know, types yeah. of creatures. I, I agree with that. The, the Anunnaki, I think, is another way to, to look at that. Um, when they talk about how they came from another planet to, you know, basically put a breed of people with on this planet, that whole thing's a lie. And that's the other thing that I'm trying to make sure everyone understands. This is all fallen angels. This has to do with corruption of man. Uh, whether they came from another planet, it's because they were the fallen angel on another planet. They may take people there and then breed them into something else and then breed them back. Whatever the circumstances are, uh, it is a hodgepodge. There is a great, great variety. And that's also why there's a war between them. They don't necessarily get along. Uh, if, just like uh, the Illuminati, if you have 13 families and then the 300 families below it, the Bushes versus uh, uh, anyone else that tried to run against them, they're, they're still on the same page for world dominance and control, but who's going to be the one in control is what they're fighting over. And I believe that those that are of the different breeds of the hybrids, that's exactly the case. All right, very interesting. And you know, one thing that we've we've noted before in past shows, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but many of these elites claim to literally be descendants of Nephilim and descendants of Aga Bashan and all these different Nephilim uh, tribes. And, and it's interesting. I mean, there's so many different ties you can make into all this stuff that uh, even with the Anunnaki and the Anakim and all these different re uh, regions of the area. And we, we're me and David are pulling a documentary together right now on the, the Gauls and the people of Galatia and just studying the history of the land and the history of the people that were there before. So it's interesting. But anyways, we'll go to the next question. Um, Kelly says, or Kiel, Kiel is the name. Uh, could you ask Scott if he has ever heard of, or if he's ever run into a spiritual attack that mocked a gang stalking experience or if gang stalking ever happens in tandem with the spiritual realm. Also, this may seem odd if he's ever heard of supernatural feeding off someone being attracted to the, traction motors and electromagnetics on a locomotive engine and uh, 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 and he says thank you very much i don't know if that was too much to ask at the same time but or if you got all that but if you want to start with the first question we can do that first well uh, gang stalking and demonic go hand in hand because when you have somebody who's terrorized when you have somebody that's under distress they're not operating um in full protection most, most of the people that are gang stuck doesn't necessarily mean that they're a Christian. Now, whenever you have an abomination, whenever you have a violation against God's people, that is a open door. So Satan doesn't play fair. Whenever a child is molested, the child gets a demon. There's a transfer. There's something that takes place. And again, this was something that we were not intended to be subject to. When, um, when I deal with anyone that is, that is a TI that is being gang stalked, they will always have a demon. They'll have a demon of fear. They'll have a demon of, of depression, uh, hopelessness. Uh, this all also comes through mind control because then they can sway them. So, yes, it goes hand in hand. So, but it doesn't mean that the people who come to me who need a deliverance doesn't mean they are gang stalked. They may think they're being gang stalked, but it's actually the hoodlums or the demons themselves. And almost always, somewhere along the line, they were in the occult or their family was in the occult. I get a lot of people whose mothers were practicing witches, and they literally think they're gang stalked by electronic means, by the NSA or whatever, and it turns out that's not the case at all. So it's a, it's a big mixture. Um, right now, you know, gang stalking in my ministry is fairly new for, for the past couple of years, and I'm still trying to discern who's who. And, and by the way, one of the things I do, I don't know if you can see it, 
Um, if, if someone's being electronically harassed, I'll scan them. I have metal detectors, so I look for chips. I look. I have a small radio receiver that's very broad banded. That if there's if the chip is actually transmitting, and I have found it. And this device here is if there's a, a psychotronic technology being implemented on them. Are they being targeted by a satellite? Are they being targeted by somebody of a third party? So I'm trying to address everything, and then I have to put it in categories. But right now I'm finding that it's a mixture of everything. So, so I guess the answer would be yes on that. Now, as far as, I'm not sure if I understood that. Were they saying that they're attracted to things that create electromagnetics? Is that what I'm understanding? Um, have, or do they feed off those things like traction motors and uh, electromagnetics? You mean as far as uh, Nephilim or gang stalkers? Or is it natural beings, whatever, are associated with uh, the supernatural? Um, yeah. In, in fact, uh, that that's actually a very good question. Um, it's one of the reasons that I think that uh, that you'll find UFOs around nuclear power plants. I think it's the electromagnetic itself that not that they feed off of it like it gives them power. I think they're able to use it much like Montauk was using electromagnetics to induce something. Now, um, when we talked about the atom bomb, when it explodes, we're not talking about a detonation of substances where two chemicals come together that it explodes. We're actually talking about a disruption of atoms that causes fusion. So there's a whole different philosophy or a whole different science when that takes place, and that's what CERN's doing. But when it comes to electromagnetics, there does seem to be um, a when you, when you say feeding, I think I think what it is that they're actually trying to use the radio waves to their advantage. Um, but uh, 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 any device could be used for that. And and by the way, I think that um, those uh, that are part of the Montauk boys, the ones that are still being harassed, whenever something appears to them human or non-human, they always have a device with them that is part of the electromagnetic alteration that allows them to come and go in, in and out of the realm. So that may be part of that. But in either case, I think that uh, that's something, again, that Tesla discovered, that there is a relationship with it. And it was his ability to harness that that led to his equipment being confiscated because they realize the potential of weaponry for it so yes you to to be able to use demons to be able to use these entities for your control again i think was part of montauk i think that um anytime that you have the willful act to to inflict harm onto innocent individuals that in itself is an attraction to demons wartime uh post-traumatic stress is the devil's playground Anytime that you have an infraction on, on humanity, you have a violation on humanity, uh, anything can go. So I hope that makes sense. Very good. Um, next question is from uh, Donna. It says, what, hap what helps determine if a person has been gang stalked or has opened the door to devils? Um, well, I always do a, a very lengthy interview. And I'll find that, uh, that there are generational curses. I'll find that the individual, like I said, that maybe they had a parent or a grandparent that was into witchcraft. So I'll, I'll address that first. So, so let, me, let me answer it this way. The first thing I focus on, whether they're gang stalked or not, is to get their demons out of them, to get the curses broke off of them, to close the doors. And then, then I can distinguish whether... If there's a remnant left over, if there's something left over, then maybe then we'll address gang stalking, we'll address psychotronics, case in point. The first one that I came across was a young girl who kept hearing voices, basically, you know, schizophrenia. After several deliverances with me and another individual who have always been successful at this, she st still heard voices. Well, through interviewing her now to another level, we found that, that she had a father who was in the military, had to do with Area 51, had to do with black ops. 
and because of the background security levels that took place, that she was included in that background search. So otherwise, when they tried to determine what level of security that her father would be at, that a flag comes up. Otherwise, her personality, her history, met a criteria. And so a lot of the gang stalkers are selected because somebody in their family was in the military and had a particular security clearance. And in that background investigation, that's how they were picked. So there's different levels that I approach now to find out whether that person is gang stalked or whether it's demonic. But I always deal with the demonic first, always. This also gives the person the hope and is able to call on uh, the basically the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit to help them through these times. So that's my first rule. Get the demons out first. We'll deal with the gang stalking later. All right. Uh, Valerie asks, I wonder, uh, I'm sorry, let me move on. That was more of a statement. Okay. So um, Allison asks, will incest produce similar effects? Absolutely. In fact, uh, that's one of the main avenues for the occult that uh, many of the, um, those that are female will have sex with their sons. And what that does then is that there's not only, you know, they, they become one flesh and a sense that was that is an abomination that God never intended and because of this bond there's a whole sense a, a whole nother level of the demonic that has a right there's empowerment through this so it, it, but as far as uh, I'm not sure if you're trying to relate that with um, gang stalking or whether in electronics or not but everybody that's in the black ops anyone that's of the black nobility anybody that's in these organizations um, they're all part of it, and they use all this technology. All right. Uh, Rudy asks, um, do you believe in time travel in regards to going back in time and missive history? And I think you've you've covered that, but I'm going to ask it one more time just so that you can, in case. Well, a, absolutely. And, and I say that, that I believe in it because it's just simply a matter of science of altering uh, the, the, the particular um, electrons, the magnetic fields, the influence that you project on it, it's the ability to control it. The, the supercomputers, the Cray computers, the IBM computers, there still has to be the ability to control it because if you can't control it, you'll end up opening something up and opening it up and you can't do anything with it. So it's the ability to control it that really is the incredible science behind it. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, just now, real quickly, do you ahead. believe it's possible to go backward and forward in time or just yes. back? Yeah, yes, I do. And and now, is there limitations? You know, you, you brought up a good point. Then then could someone go and interrupt Jesus from, from dying on the cross? Uh, that's a very good question. So what is the limitation? What is the ability? What, where can, what, where does it all stop? I have no idea. Um, but again, this, this is something that the fallen angels have convinced humans to create. Otherwise they had the information. They had the technical know-how they needed man because it's man's sin that gives this the perp gives the ability to happen. So with them building the devices, with them supplying the materials, with them, with them assembling the necessary uh, components to disrupt the magnetic fields, to disrupt the dimensions, to be able to, to warp time and space, wormholes. Again, this is part of uh, Einstein's theory, though Tesla didn't agree with it. I think because he, again, was working on 291,000 miles versus 186,000 miles. In either case, yes, I do. And I believe that it's in the wrong hands. It's still angelic information or angelic uh, technology. So, yes. All right. Uh, Lance asks, um, can you ask Scott what an incubus or succubus attack consists of? And he's not looking for an R-rated answer. Just wanted to know. Sure. Well, whether a person is sexually attacked in their bed, and by the way, it usually takes place in bed or can take place in water because you can have water spirits. 
that a that a succubus is a spirit that usually uh, is one to to engage with men, an incubus for for uh, for um, for women, but it, but in either case there is a violation. There is one where a woman's womb will be violated. Now that is usually a case where someone had engaged in a ritual whether they had uh, engaged with somebody who had this spirit, because anybody that fornicates is going to give the demons a legal right that the person that they were with to transfer over to them. They also become one flesh. So you can still have spirits that are of spirits of perversion that, that, that do not necessarily have to be an incubus or a succubus. So you can still have different things that take place. But these are, uh, by the way, it's escalating. It seems to be coming more. And Hollywood, Hollywood brags about doing it too, by the way. They refer to it as, as um, uh, again, their lover. They'll actually refer to a spirit or a demon. Now, these are disembodied, by the way. And that means that they're not in the physical. But because of the sin that takes place in allowing the demon within the body, a disembodied spirit, whether it's a, if it's a spirit of perversion, they want to inhabit a body so they can act out their ugly nature. So they can actually use the person to engage what they are. So if they're a spirit of anger, then you have a person who's angry. If you have a, a spirit of fear, then you have a person who acts in fear. If you have a spirit of perversion, then you have a person who acts in perversion. All right. Um, I just something real quick john on this it's your show man you do you add what you want well just to real very briefly on our program on lucid dreaming we touched on this and i remember we read a label from some pills that are sold at walmart that actually uh part of their advertising promo is that it will help you to have sexual experiences during your sleep wow. so this is how far this thing is going Wow, there's a drug sold at Walmart that does that, huh? Wow. Yeah, literally. And I remember we read the labels of some of these on the show we did with Mark Rogers on Lucid Dreaming that this is being taught the techniques of how to bring on, invite these devils to have this sexual experience during sleep. And they're even, uh, you know, they got pills that'll help you do it, you know. So this I is. Don't how remember, I don't remember that part of the show. I must have been like dozed off or something. That's crazy. Um, so I guess I'll go to the next question. Keel asks, um, I am a combat veteran from Iraq and I would wonder if you can elaborate on gang stalking on combat veterans or veterans of Iraqi in general, of Iraq in general. I mean, well, let me go back to Vietnam. Voice to skull technology was actually implemented for what they call the tunnel rats, the guys that would actually crawl down into the tunnels. And the CIA had put this together, and what they had done is, is uh, use this technology so when the guy went in the tunnel, that through their mind, they were able to communicate with the people on top. When Vietnam was over, they didn't stop the project. They continued to use these guys, and they didn't know it. And so that's a form of gang stalking, to continue to induce voices into a person's head to maybe manipulate or control them. So that form of military gang stalking has been going on a very long time. Now, one of the things that is uh, part of their program is to see what it takes for a person that if their constitution is strong, let's say if you're a soldier and you're a seasoned, hardened soldier, you can pretty much take anything. So I would say the harder, the, the more secure that a soldier is, the more likely he may be a test subject because they want to see what it takes to break him down. They want to see what it takes to have him implode, commit suicide. By the way, it's one of the reasons we have about 25 veterans killing themselves a day is the gang stalking is this. Because one, the things that they did see over there, the horrors and the atrocity that they had to commit, that is a, a very blood tainted ground. So the very fact that they were there they most likely picked up a bunch of spirits and they brought them back. And so a lot of the people that uh, are here now need, need drastically a deliverance 
have, have post-traumatic stress and they're not receiving it. So gang stalking comes in many forms, but yes, absolutely. The military seems to be a prime target. Kelvin asks, is nanotech the modern alchemy? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the one of the forms of alchemy is, you know, taking lead and turn it into gold. When you can take a, a um, element, let's look at the periodic table, times it by a thousand now. So if you have one element and you can alter it into many different forms to be to to react differently with other metals, um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good way to put that. I guess I never thought of it, but no, that's a good good point. Yes. Yeah, and this is one of the things that we have talked a lot about, and you see it with Eucharistic miracles in Catholicism that I believe is going to be a big part in the final worship of the false prophet is transmutation. It's actually an alchemical change of the, the wine and the bread into real flesh and blood. And there's a lot of Eucharistic miracles even now taking place. And this is done through this type of, um, you know, magic. And witchcraft, it's exactly what it is. Right. All right. Uh, Allison asks, um, do you think in Luke 4, 5, when it speaks of the devil showing Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, does that qualify as time travel to you? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, that so little is said to us for us to really understand what took place. I think that uh, by giving him, you know, trying to trying to to lure him to seduce Jesus, which was absolutely ridiculous, but it but it's a good example of just how low Satan will go. That in Christ rejecting it, that he himself already knew what he could do, that that was something that you know didn't interest him at all because he was here for a purpose. But is that time travel? Could it include it? Yeah, I guess it could. Uh, I, but that's not the way that I really look at it. No. All right. So Alec asks, and this is a question that is kind of follows up with, not really follows up with that, but it goes right along with it. So if time travel is possible and can be achievable, wouldn't the Bible mention something about it? Because everything Yahweh created, he puts laws in them like heat and light. There's the law of thermodynamics, etc. cetera. Well, I, and I'm glad you asked that question. And here's the subject that, either people get it or they get really upset. We have 66 books. Well, that's unfortunately a demonic number. I believe that there was a great attempt to keep us from having all the books that would have explained this in more detail. When we look at the Book of Enoch, we then all of a sudden understand what a demonic spirit is. When we look at uh, Jubilees or Jasher or some of the others that were taken from us, I believe in the Vatican Library are the books that would explain that to us. Now, you can, you can take some of the scripture and try and twist it one way or another to, to say some of these, just like people do with doctrines. But I believe that a lot of the things that would have told us have been kept from us. Again, the Jesuits, when they sacked Jerusalem, they grabbed about every book they could, and they immediately took them to the Pope. So there's many things that could have been for us to understand this stuff that we are kept from. So that's how I see it. I think that is about all the top questions that we have time for. It's 11.59, midnight's getting ready to ride in right now. There's a ton of other questions, but uh, if you guys have any more questions, make sure to direct them towards, you can go to scotthensler.com. Is that correct, scotthensler.com? Yes, you can, well, .org or .org. Tinfoil Hat Club. And uh, you can ask more questions to him that way. And also, if you have any more questions for David Carrico, you can ask him that way. I have a guy that's trying to get in on the show here, uh, my, my son here. So what's up, buddy? Hi. And, John, hi. I have one more brief question I would like to ask Scott. And I, but with the nature of the show, I think it would be good for us to close out in prayer tonight. But have you ever heard – of a connection between Project Montauk and the huge uh, hospital for the mentally ill. Hey, buddy. 
uh, there was the largest insane asylum in the world that was built on Long Island. And this actually gave Geraldo Rivera his rise to fame when he went in there and he photographed the people lying in squalor. And it came out that these individuals were being prostituted and used in satanic rituals. And there was actually a movie done about this place. Samuel Jackson was in it. But have you ever heard any connections between that mental uh, facility in Montauk? Um, yeah, I've heard, I've heard people that, uh, that were familiar with it say that a lot of the people they worked with ended up there and it was so they could keep an eye on them to look at their progress. But I would also include the very large asylum that was in Buffalo. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It was actually built during the Civil War. Um, you know, they originally called uh, post-traumatic stress soldier's heart. Then they called it uh, battle fatigue. Then they called it shell shocked. And then they called it PS, you know, post-traumatic stress. So, yes, I have heard that. Um, and I do remember when Geralda did that. I was actually watching TV when that took place. And the video that they showed over the TV even then was uh, absolutely horrifying. But a lot of the asylums were nothing more than the experimentation. Yeah. And um, so, and, and I believe that that's still taking place. And the sad thing of it is, is those who are in the asylums, there is hope, there is freedom for them. And unfortunately, because of the, um, the, the stronghold that keeps them in there, many of them will never never be released and it's uh, it's a sad thing so but i just want to thank you scott for all you brought to the table tonight it's been a very very compelling uh broadcast it's went by really really quickly and because of the nature of this broadcast it's been very heavy let's do close out with a word of prayer tonight and let's just lift up all of those that have been fallen prey to this Heavenly Father, we do just want to come before you now and we just want to lift up all of the individuals that have been victimized by these strategies of SRA and PIs and all of the horrific things. And Father, we know that there's nothing that the enemy can do that you can't undo. And Lord, we just want to speak hope into the lives and hearts of those that have been victimized by this type of abuse and lord we just want to let them know and lord you let them know by the power of your holy spirit that there is hope and deliverance and freedom in jesus and lord we just want to lift up scott and his ministry and all of those that are truly trying to help individuals in this horrific abuse and lord we just want to pray for now you see tv that lord you'll just keep now you see tv and like-minded ministries on the air so we can have a format to talk about these issues so lord we just want to thank you and praise you for all your mighty ways you are king of kings and lord of lords and we give you the praise for everything good that happens in jesus name we pray amen and amen amen thank you amen and amen and i got my future uh now you see tv host here he's uh he woke up and he's here with me. So it's a good, good timing to get ready to close this stuff out. He's my little mini me. He's he's awesome. So, just blessings to all of you guys for listening tonight. As always, we're very thankful for all of our our listeners. I mean, you guys are amazing. You're very smart. You you really test things out, which is what we encourage. No matter who says it, you test out things and you learn for yourself, which is great. So. Um, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you, David, for the midnight ride. Such a blessing to Now You See TV, one of my favorite shows every week, and we're just always thankful to have it. Scott Hensler, thank you for coming on. And everybody, high five. Give me a high five, Levi. High five. And we are blessed to have you. And can you tell everybody shalom? Bye, Janelle. <laughs> shalom, everybody. Shalom. Take care. Good night.